Puerto Rico. Okay, so uh, we're basically doing my DEF CON presentation from this summer. Uh, I actually had an interesting moment half an hour ago and it looked like my copy of the slides had been deleted. <laughs> So there was there was a sheer moment of terror because I thought that the most secure place where I put my slides was not in order, and then um, turned out to be one of those UX snafus. The Macintosh windows you can place objects outside of the visible window, and you don't see you don't have scroll bars. So I had tried scrolling in a variety of directions, but apparently not the right direction. So it was exactly where it was supposed to be, just out off screen somehow just to keep things interesting. So anyway, this is the, the DEF CON hack, um, Hardware Hacking Village presentation from uh, DEF CON uh, 2021. Uh, that's why the, the logo there on the corner. And uh, yeah, so I think you all know me already, but in brief, I've had the privilege of spending my entire career on free and open source software. I'm currently the product management director for Ceph at Red Hat. Previously, I was the Ubuntu server PM at Canonical. And if you go back the decade, I was the systems management Tsar at SUSE. So you could say that the task has nothing to do with my day job. I'm a manager. So as a former embedded developer, this is officially my definition of fun. The obligatory disclaimer is that we'll most likely break some hardware playing with it and it will come out of your pocket. No liability if you follow our instructions and stub your toe or bring about the end of the world, or simply break your device, which is far more likely. So you have been warned. With great power comes great responsibility, so don't do anything you should not. Don't just obey the law, but also be nice. Let's get going. We have a ton of slides. Uh, I think it's like 63 slides. And uh, technically, we could even do two demos. So we have to hustle a little bit. Now, this talk is all about abusing the security assumptions we have made about USB devices. A security analyst posted a dissection of the most impressive device here, which is actually one of the smallest ones. So I went around and started shopping for all sorts of random things. Fanciest device is here in the Intel branded box. Usually when we open it, it plays the Intel tune, which by the way is no longer the Intel tune. They rebranded their soundtrack this summer, um, which probably is a horrible abuse of their trademark since there is something truly evil in there. But the battery is running out. So it's um, that joke is not working too well anymore. You need to change the battery. So let's start with something much more benign before we go all dark and deep. Um, this is something that was on sale on ThinkGeek when ThinkGeek existed. Um, I think it was bought out by GameStop and then um, uh, phased out as a brand. Uh, I think it was a Black Friday a few years ago. And there is a whole class of devices called Annoyatron something you would lose in the cubicle of someone you don't particularly like. And every once in a while, it would make a chirping sound just to annoy them, like um, make a squeak, no idea where the sound comes from. And this is the computer version of that. This is actually nicely designed, not something you have to fiddle with uh, software to configure. Here there are switches, physical switches. It is a USB device. Uh, with the dial for time delay. You select the time delay and it will flip your caps lock, tap the keyboard, move the mouse, or perhaps all three. And this is perhaps the most benign of these things. Garrett Mace designed a smaller stealth USB caps locker about 10 years ago for April Fool's Day um, and that you can build. Or you can make one with an $8 DigiSpark if you don't, do not want to fiddle with ProtoBoard and uh, make your own from scratch. So in Garrett's version, maybe less polished, but uh, quite interesting nonetheless, 
it fits co almost completely in your USB port, as you can see uh, there on the right. It uses an Atmel AVR 80 Tiny 45, and it has great educational value as you learn how to run a USB stack right on top of the hardware, no operating system helping you out there. Carrying out this attack is hideously simple. Obviously, you can do it without any particular privileges. You just stick it in the back of the computer of your victim, and when they log in, it will have access. In some cases, even without logging in, because it is a keyboard, an HID class device, to be precise. So it is a keyboard and or a mouse. This one is innocent enough, but from there, things get quickly worse. So the HID class of USB, pro USB protocol defines human interaction devices, keyboards, mice, game controllers, a variety of other low bandwidth devices like mag stripe readers, which are really keyboards. These are all HID devices in the USB world. Thermometers, RFID readers, barcode scanners, even UPS batteries are interfaced as HID devices. At Princeton, they actually taught a class about turning random hardware into an HID device as their class project. They would just go to a junkyard, find something that they found interesting, and then uh, your pro uh, project for the class would be turning that into an a, a device with a USB HID interface. You can find the, the lectures online. It's actually a pretty cool idea in, in um, a way to teach um, embedded programming to undergraduates. One benefit of a well-defined specification like the USB HID class is the abundance of device drivers available in modern operating systems. On the downside are the inherent trust keyboards are extended and the possibility for USB devices to change their type or announce additional sub-devices while plug plugged in. Combined with USB's default behavior of accepting any device that connects to it, if there is a driver, Let's start to look at how this can be exploited. So Tomo is a very small device, also not meant to do anything evil. It is basically the size of a YubiKey. You, of course, know what a YubiKey is. It's a second factor device that basically fits inside a USB port. You tap it, it generates a number in a, in a pseudo-random sequence that's used to, to authenticate you as a second factor. Um, Tomo is a USB platform to prototype things like YubiKeys. The author explained that while a YubiKey costs around $50, a similar device can be built for $2 in parts. So his intent here is to drive down the co cost of that kind of device by an order of magnitude. But you don't have to build YubiKeys uh, with Tomo. You have a microcontroller, so you can build pretty much whatever you want. The only thing is, what do you have? You have a Cortex-M0, so you're writing to bare metal, no OS again. Eight kilobytes of RAM and 64 kilobytes of flash. Oh, and it's the first open source hardware association part certified out of Australia. Uh, so it has a cool uh, 0001 serial number in, in their certification record. It's available from Seed Studio, so you don't have to go and assemble your own or, or order a printed board and, uh, and then um, uh, do surface mount soldering on, on your own if you, if you don't feel like enduring that particular kind of pain. It has way more flash than a DigiSpark, 64K instead of 8K, and uh, the price is comparable. And you have two buttons, two LEDs. You don't have a whole lot of software or complex stacks here. Um, but if what you are doing is USB and has a two button, two LED UI, you can basically build it here. This could potentially be a hidden device fitting inside the USB port entirely. On the other hand, there are much better platforms for an attack. Later, we will see one with four cores and eight gigs of RAM. But it is interesting to prototype this kind of YubiKey-like applications, limited interaction, but you could probably build your Anoyatron with this platform. 
It also seems like completely interaction-free devices are not as interesting, or at least not as malevolent. I guess things are interesting only when they cause trouble. So let's look at something that will cause trouble. So I plugged in the Anoyatron and have access to your keyboard. Either because the OS trusts keyboards inherently and lets them in, or because I leave that plugged in and when you log in, the device gets in. You usually need both to occur. Again, physical access is both necessary and sufficient condition to pwn the device. We have an entire industry of pen testers and the gold standard for them is a keystroke injection tool disguised as a USB device, as a USB drive, um, which is this, the rubber ducky. The USB rubber ducky is the original keystroke injection tool. It's about 10 years old, although the hardware has been updated. While it looks like a USB drive to us, it acts like a keyboard when talking to the operating system and typing over 1,000 words a minute. Specially crafted payloads written in a custom scripting language mimic a trusted human user while entering keystrokes at superhuman speed. It is named this way because if it quacks like a keyboard, then it must be a keyboard. You have the shell. You can type your way to success. You don't need a crafted overflow. Just type on the shell. And from the keyboard, you can always start a shell with Windows R in case you don't have one. And off you go. This is the full rubber ducky kit in its current version. Uh, first and third are parts to assemble it into a standard USB thumb drive case. Well, standard a few years ago, now they may look different. The second is meant to enable keystroke injection on a micro USB device, effectively enabling HID attacks on Android smartphones. Then we have a USB adapter to load payloads into a micro SD card. You put this, the SD card into this adapter, plug it into your computer, load the payloads into a micro SD card, like a drive, because with this adapter, a card looks like a drive. Um, then put the SD card back into the ducky. Now when the ducky and the ducky unit is plugged in, that SD card will look like a keyboard, or rather that SD card will provide the keyboard with its input. And you can see what the rubber ducky looks like uh, in the, um, the fifth uh, part there on display. Closing in on the hardware, on the left is the micro SD card slot that conveniently lets you swap a library of pre-made payloads without having to load them every time. Just keep a library of cards. The replay button is in the center of the shot. This is convenient during development to avoid having to remove and replug the USB drive all the time. Your fingers will thank you because the edges of the PCB board are pretty sharp and they will cut you. Um, but it's also good on the device so you, you don't stress the solder joint between the PCB and the USB-A connector. Um, the use of the button can also be redefined although it is not accessible from outside the case. You need the case open to, to be able to um, see and operate the button. Finally, the LED up top lets you know when the payload is running. Green when it works, red when there is some issue. And again, the LED is also concealed when the case is closed. On the, on the flip side, we have the Atmel AVR CPU powering the device and some support electronics. The pins on the left side should be a JTAG header, but I've never seen them used, so I'm not 100% sure. Okay, so let's look into the specs. The system is AVR powered. While it is not an Arduino in practice, it resembles it in many ways. Uh, the internal flash and RAM make uh, make board bring up simpler. If you are an embedded developer, you know what I'm talking about. And the potentially unlimited mass storage through the SD card interface 
make it extremely flexible in the kind of payloads it can carry. Um, the LED can flash in multiple colors, signaling execution state or error during development. JTAG and GPIO access combined with the standard Atmel DFU bootloader make this a potentially moddable platform. But we haven't seen much hacking in terms of modifying the Ducky itself because it is not a particularly cheap device. Um, we usually see clones uh, being developed instead uh, rather, than, um, rather than mods. So look, it's a keyboard. This is how Windows sees it. Uh, this is how the SB thumb drive looks like when you actually plug it in. Not that anybody is usually looking at the devices when you when you plug in something, but if you are, um, that's what you see. This is a Windows 10 system at the latest update level. All that Windows is going to do is warn you that it is configuring an existing driver at the first time the device is plugged in. After that, it will never do anything. Uh, it will never tell you anything. And the um, uh, so you can see an overlay in the bottom right corner in the notification clo area close to the sys tray, uh, but it doesn't ask for permission. Uh, it doesn't ask for anything. And in fact, this one-time message is self-dismissing. Once the configuration is done, it just disappears. So unless you're looking for it, um, uh, you will not notice that there is this message, probably. Um, by now, we have all understood that we have a rogue keyboard to do our bidding, uh, but what can we do with it? So there are three primary attack vectors uh, that we have to be concerned with. The first is file exfiltration. That is copying files to a remote web server. The ducky is a keyboard. You don't copy files to a keyboard. <laughs> so the keyboard, the ducky, is instructing the system to copy files to a remote drop in some bad part of the internet, anonymizing the attacker, but still providing retrievability at a later time. A second attack in the Windows environment is exfiltrating domain credentials and passwords as a default target. Even if encrypted, these are a prize target as the attacker can brute force them offsite on its own on his own time. And you can always get Wi-Fi passwords while you are at it. These are already in the clear in Windows. Just ask them with NetShow, and Windows will tell you what the Wi-Fi passwords are. A third attack vector is in initiating a reverse shell. And the ducky can start a reverse shell in just three seconds, beating any human user at this task. So now, live, I would do a demo, but uh, with one camera and having to switch to the Windows machine, it's um, it's a little bit difficult. So let me check. Yes, I have backup slides. So you will use the backup slides. Showing you what the demo does. So um, the preamble is that all this stuff usually targets Windows, and I'm not a Windows guy. So I have to build a little dedicated setup in my lab with um, Acer um, uh, Chromebooks, basically, but not Chromebooks, the ones that are equivalent level of cost, um, but meant for Windows. These machines can be infected with the horrible stuff we will see today, and I don't care. I can wipe them out, and if, uh, if the, well, if the um, compromise is such that even um, some more permanent part of the hardware is, uh, is infiltrated, I don't I don't have to worry. Those are basically my uh, security lab, and they can get compromised, and it it doesn't matter. There is no data there. Um, but even without assuming the paranoid scenario that some attack could compromise firmware or the like, or, or create secret partitions or anything like that, um, just a very simple thing that you have the operating system and you have to rebuild to a clean state. Uh, has definitely taught me something about Windows. I had to figure out how to do Windows backups <laughs> and how to restore them from an independent boot device so that there would be no chain of compromise, again, presuming that the firmware is, is sane. Um, so it was an interesting learning experience. It was extremely painful. Um, 
I thought that by now backing up Windows from bare metal would be easier. Um, but it's not as easy as it should be. Um, In any case, I guess I learned something about Windows backups, which may be useful. Uh, but the reality is that some of these devices, like the Rubber Ducky, have a company behind them. So there is a reputation to defend. And I'm not terribly worried about the Rubber, rubber Ducky carrying some undisclosed evil payload. But others come from nameless sellers on Alibaba or eBay. Uh, some of the devices we'll see are simply scary. Some are even known to phone home to unknown remote servers for reasons that so far we haven't been able to figure out yet. In any case, um, let's um, let's see what um, what the ducky does. But before we go there, and there is TV appearance um, of the ducky. So in unprecedented feat of um, of cinematic accuracy. The Rugbar Ducky was apparently featured in an episode of Mr. Robot. Who knew Hollywood could get hacking right, even once? This is a rubber duck. Plug this guy in, wait 15 seconds, and yank it, OK? Thanks to a cool uh, code called Mimikatz, it will pull all caches and the domain, and it will pull all passwords and the domain. Man, this guy speaks really fast, even for a hacker. Pull all past passwords and domain info. Yeah. So um, it's almost correct. I'm not sure what happened there, uh, but it is right. I guess they must have had uh, an author that actually, a technical reviewer that actually knew what was going, knew what um, hacking is for once. So uh, here are the backup slides in lieu of uh, demo. Here is basically what um, what we would be doing if we were um, switching the HDMI feed to to the external Windows um, guinea pig device and uh, carrying out the attack there. Since switching devices drives the um, the recording on jobbers and uh, up the wall, we're not going to do that. I promised a single stream. So we're going to do the um, screenshots instead. So the payload here is um, a very simple um, um, a very simple payload that basically just opens this file that is stored on the on the ducky. How do we do this? Um, Payloads have to be encoded from uh, duck code, which you see here in the window, into an inject.bin file that uh, the USB thumb drive knee keyboard can execute. So um, here is a very simple example, um, a little bit more complicated than just um, the previous one, which is just basically um, opening a, a file with hello world or hello scale was the name of the conference where this was used. Um, this one is a little bit more complicated. It waits 1,000 uh, milliseconds. So it waits one second. It presses the, um, the R key in, in the GUI. Then uh, it waits a tenth of a second. And um, it uh, enters the, the that URL string. So string is there as a type specification. It's just indicating that the following is a string. And then uh, it's entering, um, it's pressing enter. So GUI R means Windows R. So that is a Windows run command for those of you that are Windows free. Windows R is the run, uh, the run prompt. And in Windows, when you type a web um, a web URL into the run um, into the run uh, prompt, it will look at the MIME type association for that URL. It will pop up the default browser, and it will go to that URL. So 
you don't need to go and say find the path to Chrome and launch launch Chrome. Windows will do that for you. You just need to say I want to go to this URL. The thing that's interesting about Duck Code is that it's actually quite high in usability, um, which is impressive because if you think about it, in our industry only Apple gets usability consistently right, and maybe sometimes they are not perfect, but they are head and shoulders about everybody else. Um, so how is it that everybody other than Apple cannot get UX right, but uh, the people making hacking tools can? Um, that's an interesting question for me. I would like to know the answer. But duck code is quite something because it is not uh, designed as something that's convenient to encode into, into a computer. It's something that's designed as something uh, that is convenient for somebody that's um, defining a sequence of keystrokes uh, and making it easy for them. So it's a very intuitive, very straightforward thing. And it uh, it deals with things that um, that other people could trip on. I'm sorry. Um, was there a question? No. Someone no. knew, and they weren't Maybe muted. Somebody was muted. Okay. So um, there are clones, as I mentioned before. Uh, the rise of the clones. According to what I like to call the Wally law of ecosystems, in an open system, success will bring what commercially um, uh, people building a business like to refer to as freeloaders. So people that sell a product that was developed by somebody else. This is a very common scenario in open source, by the way. Um, but it is a good sign of a healthy business when you have competitors. If you're the only one making a given thing, it means that the market that you're in is very small or that you really have a killer patent, but that doesn't seem to happen in our industry. So um, in general, in the IT world, having competitors is a good sign that you have a healthy business. And so here the result is that uh, there are hardware clones using the same or similar tool chains. The MicroDuck is a stealthy HID injector that can fit in the USB-A port itself, uh, while Thomas's project is a $3 clone of a ducky built using the Digistump DigiSpark platform and a tool called duck to spark So you, you compile things using the, the ducky tool chain and, and then convert it into, um, into the appropriate binary for a DigiSpark. This kind of development shows how active and vibrant the rubber ducky community is even after a decade. This is a very popular tool. And that goes back to my point about what a healthy ecosystem looks like. A more recent take on key injection was released not long ago on Crowd Supply, commissioned by Kevin Mitnick for a conference keynote and implemented by Olaf Tan and Dennis Go. This is a redesigned ducky. The payloads in this case are written in Arduino. Uh, bootloader access within the cable can be triggered by a magnet. <coughs> Excuse me. And the Bluetooth remote endpoint is also available. This is effectively indistinguishable from a standard Apple charging cable. But equally, various micro USB versions are available. Uh, so these will perform keystroke injection attacks against. Um, against um, a mobile device, or in the case of the USB cable, against a, a desktop just as well, or a tablet. And uh, as you can see from the picture, you really can't tell anything about this cable. It looks like the standard. So what can we do to counter these attacks? Actually, uh, let me see. Um, after DEF CON, I realized that I left out I left out one interesting thing. Um, so um, as some of you may be aware, the hacker community can be a little bit uh, contentious. So uh, this is Mitnick's cable. There is um, an equally famous hacker uh, that goes by the shorthand MG. And uh, uh, he and Kevin have been trading barbs, and I'm going to get into that. But MG has developed his own cable. 
and uh, his cable is also quite awesome. And uh, I don't have the pictures here in the deck that I use for DEF CON, um, but I can show you because I have the cable. Um, and if you can see it on camera, this one, um, since I have the, the Apple version of Mitnix cable, I got the micro USB version of MG's cable. And similarly, you cannot see anything untoward here. Now, uh, MG has done some quite interesting things with this cable. Um, uh, one that stands out to me is that it has geofencing capabilities. So for example, uh, in many of these devices, the question is, when do you trigger the payload? So um, geofencing on the cable is quite cool. The cable will become active only when it's within, I don't know, let's say that you're trying to breach Red Hat security and you've given me the cable. We're in Red Hat's Westford office. You would set the geofence to say, this cable's payload will activate only when Federico is within 50 yards of, um, of Red Hat's office so that the cable will be even mm, harder to detect and, um, and idle effectively for all purposes uh, when it's not here. Uh, MG has this interesting uh, mani maniacal, I would say, attention for detail. And so there was this little tiny orange thing in the box and it took me a while to figure out what it is. And um, uh, basically it's a clip that you put on the cable because if you're working with multiple USB cables, you're going to have trouble figuring out which is which. Um, either for the purpose of identifying the um, which is loaded with which attack or <laughs> which cable is benign and which one isn't. So there are these 3D printed clips uh, that are orange or a different color that he includes um, so that you can tag the cable while you're doing work and not not uh, get confused between different builds, which is, um, well, as I said, he is one for detail. Um, there's a lot of stuff that the um, uh, MG, uh, the OMG cable, as it's known, uh, can do. And there are even versions that are designed for classroom use so that you can uh, teach students um, how to craft these attacks if you're, if you're teaching a security uh, class. Uh, and a bunch of other things. So it's um, the the subject is not uh, is not closed subject. The, this came out I think in May this year. So there is um, there is innovation going on in this sector uh, still. So uh, what we were saying, what do we do to defend yourself against these things? So you do something like this. Uh, this is basic USB security. Uh, this is a device called the Sync Stop. Uh, as a CIO, you can buy a bucket of these, order that everybody in your organization use them, and don't worry, they still won't. But uh, if you had any control of what the people in your organization do, uh, this device cuts the data lines of a USB connection, preventing data siphoning at charging stations, which is uh, the most likely scenario for somebody to, um, to give you a... Um, uh, a rogue USB connection. Uh, this is now known as the juice jacking attack. So if I'm charging anything at the airport's USB charging station or on the plane or anywhere that's not on my devices, it goes through this. So I'm sure I'm getting only power. If I'm plugging any of these rogue devices into my system to charge it, it also goes through this. So there is no data connection and there is simply no, um, no reason to, uh, to worry, period. Um, let me see, what else? So you could still try to hack me through the voltage lines. I'm sure that they will figure it out at, at some point, <laughs> um, but we're definitely not there yet. And I know that it sounds like a joke, but um, pretty much anything <laughs> that connects into a device winds up being an attack vector at some point, as you can see from the, um, uh, from the current attacks against CPUs and uh, basically figuring out what the state of the CPU is by, by looking at what it's not saying. So um, 
I'm sure that someday voltage will be a problem. Um, so far, I've seen only RFID attacks against uh, cables with proximity. Uh, I haven't seen a way to inject uh, messages into a cable. Um, maybe that's a military level kind of expertise um, that it's not come down to uh, to a um, normal, a more normal uh, industrial espionage level. But uh, yeah, don't discount what uh, what people can do when they're highly motivated. Um, so uh, this device seems like basic prophylaxis. It is not always practical because it is stopping devices from providing you power, providing you power from adding data on top of that. But in a lot of cases, uh, we um, we just want power, and this is fine. In a lot of other cases, we actually want data. This is a data bus, right? <laughs> So um, a more customizable approach could be to build a device like the USB Safe 2. Conceivably, when you control the firmware, you could choose what behavior to respond with. You could decide to filter on the class of the device, even the ID of the device, or some other property like the serial number. The current device protect the current USB Safe 2 protects you from excessive voltage. Um, which is limited to preset levels and most interestingly sets in software the data protection mode this means we can choose where the data line we can choose what the data lines are connected or blocked in software which is why i'm saying this could be an interesting platform to build something more complex on here's an interesting idea it would take a serious amount of effort if the value can be demonstrated and you would need to add a full USB stack here that right now is not present. So it's not a trivial exercise and the hardware would need revving. Uh, since, but since pretty much every time I speak about this, um, someone asks me how I would do it. Um, here is how I would do it. This is where I would start. Uh, the USB safe is also interesting to monitor uh, what is actually going on in a USB chain as it has independent LEDs for data and power lines. So you can see them uh, here um, at the USB A side of the board. You see those data and power uh, labels. Up top and the bottom, the board is a two-layer sandwich. Uh, the LEDs are in the bottom layer. The single uh, button up top in the middle of the picture controls the current level uh, of voltage permitted and the data pass through or blocking behavior. So this is um, uh, on the flip side, uh, one uh, toggle of the button I'm sorry, one uh, setting on the button is toggle, while the other is press and hold. And these modes are conveniently stenciled on the back. So you have the whole manual there. <laughs> By the way, I don't think this will protect your electronics from a deliberate USB killer type of attack where a, a capacitor is wired into a USB device and discharges 200 volts to deliberately destroy whatever it is plugged into. But it will definitely help while you're developing your own electronics as it stops over voltages up to 15 volts. So it, um, it protects you from your own snafus. Another company called Capable Robot has announced a programmable USB hub that has the ability to switch on and off power and data lines from software. Uh, they meant it as a way to plug and unplug mis misbehaving peripherals on a robot or for hardware testing. So when something fails in the robot, turn it off, turn it back on, <laughs> the, the ultimate in the buggy. Um, or you have in your QA lab, lots of, uh, of units of a certain device and you need to power cycle them to, for testing. Depending on actual software implementation, this may be closer to what I was describing when it eventually ships. Of course, blocking by device ID, vendor ID, or serial number can be bypassed by any attacker privy to your security policy and willing to craft an attack against you. They know what type of devices you're using in your office. 
they can make your rogue devices that they are uh, using against you have that device or vendor ID. Uh, so to stop that, we would need cryptographic certificates, um, oh, which in turn require a managing authority actually willing to revoke the chain of trust of rogue players, which is not the USB forum. USB organization is mm, just making a little bit of money by licensing trademarks and giving um, device um, vendor ID numbers out to individual vendors. They are not in the business of kicking vendors out. They're in the in business of selling um, vendors um, ranges of the, of the namespace. So I know that this may not be in the, in the ideal thing to say <laughs> in a Linux environment, but I think that this can only be solved by Microsoft. Basically, you need somebody that's a big player that's up in the chain, that doesn't care about revenue coming from the hardware to be willing to tackle the thorny policy problem and say, no, this is a bad actor. We're going to blacklist them and forbid uh, the use of, of that ID. It's a thorny policy problem. It's an expensive problem. It's a lot of work and it comes with a lot of bad karma. So nobody has stepped up to it. Um, but uh, maybe we'll eventually have to. Um, another device getting even fancier here is called PISA. A similar thing, but instead of being a pass-through, this is a USB storage device. You have three buttons and a tiny OLED screen. Basically, it is a tiny Linux computer geared to providing more flexible storage than a plain card would. It is built on a Pi Zero, so it cannot provide the USB on-the-go behavior of switching between host and device. But it is still quite interesting. It comes with a kit of screws, and you combine it with a Pi Zero to produce a working computer. I think of it as a super flash drive built on a Pi Zero. It comes with a hardware kit uh, to screw on the Pi Zero. Um, in some versions, it includes a 3D printed cover to make it more robust and durable for everyday use. It's USB 2 and not much else to say there. I have not found an application for this yet, at least not an evil one, uh, but here is an interesting idea. You can have a demo application that's um, um, a masquerading drive or a transforming drive. Press but button one, it provides you with the Arch Linux boot. Press button two, now it's an Ubuntu boot ISO. Option three, now it's Fedora. Option four, now it's Kali. I don't know. It is cute. Conceptually, it is like the Tomo we have seen earlier, but now we are higher up the stack. We have all of Linux on the device, not just uh, bare metal programming. And obviously, it is more powerful and has more storage. Uh, but this is the same button plus USB interaction model supplemented with a tiny screen so it can talk back to you, at least a little. Let's go back to evil things, where we left the ducky. For pen testers, the solution is to get in. Um, that's what they're paid for. They have a contract to do it. So they get in, they put a few plants on the right machines, and when some of you log in in the morning, they are in. Besides, your machines are not patched, <laughs> usually. So it's too easy. It's like shooting fish in a barrel. But it gets worse. At some point, someone realized that different classes of USB devices have different inherent permissions. For example, a storage class device may get different access from a network card. So enter the bash bunny, the grown-up sibling of the rubber ducky. This one, same vendor, by the way, can do on the on-the-go behavior we were discussing earlier on steroids. This USB stick show up as a storage device. A minute later, it is a network card, and then it can become a keyboard. It keeps connecting and disconnecting to change the driver, it, uh, the driver it talks to um, if it needs to. Because different classes have different capabilities and different impl implicit or explicitly granted trust. What is absolutely amazing to me is that in our industry, where basically no one can get UX right, <laughs> basically, unless you work for Apple, your product sucks. 
usable, usable these security products are amazing. They are actually really easy to use. Uh, so as I said before, I don't understand why they can get UX right and no one else can, but it's amazing to me. So the specs on this hardware are absolutely impressive. Quad core CPU, half a gig of RAM, eight gigs of storage. Um, the interesting attack vector, uh, additional attack vector enabled by the Bash Bunny is to show up as a network device. So you plug in, advertise a very fast route with fantastic metrics. You can do this so that the right network driver is already there in Windows by default. So there is no permission or approval required. It will just be auto configured. And now you can get the system to route all network traffic of the machine into this fake network that apparently you told the machine has amazing performance compared to anything else on earth. Now, as traffic comes into your device in the fake network, you can inspect it before forwarding it out to the normal interface so that it actually reaches its intended destination. You're inspecting all of the machine's network traffic, but no one monitoring the corporate network ever sees what you're doing because it is happening on local host. It's not where their um, network monitoring equipment is looking. Um, there are lots of exploits that are already been written for the Bash Bunny, so you do not even need to put in the effort to code them, which is scary. You get in the network path as the default route, then you are nice and you let them see the internet just so that you don't, and so they don't notice you're actually there. A different take on the theme is the Cactus WHID. This one includes a Wi Fi access point, so your HID attack is no, lo no longer blind. Uh, we're looking for all intensive purposes to a hardware remote shell. Note the case it ships in. Uh, it ships with. Once it's locked, it cannot be opened without breaking it. It, it seals. Um, but it ships open for inspection, which is great for our pictures. So we can take pictures without breaking it uh, until we decide to lock it up. As you can see, the Wi-Fi part of the device is powered by the inevitable ESP8266. And to facilitate the process of weaponizing USB gadgets, you can wire another USB device's pins to the pads on the bottom left here. The new attack vector that you're seeing here is that you go on eBay and you get a USB powered knickknack like a plasma globe or a Nerf gun turret. And you wire the data lines into this. Pass through the power from the host device you're parasitizing so that there is power here and the host device is supplying it. Now you have a plasma globe with a big company name on it. And uh, it is basically a social exploit between, without the social. You just mail it to them. You got a plasma globe from Hewlett Packard. Congratulations. They don't know that it doesn't come from HP. You just bought it off eBay and then you sent it over. So beware unexpected devices in the mail. There are the new hardware enabled spear phishing. Uh, this seems already bad enough, but fear not, it gets worse. Now, this is actually rather outrageous, and it is making me lose faith in, faith in the concept of computer security as a whole, to be honest. Why bother hacking you with a device if I can hack you with a cable? Uh, from the picture, it looks like it is a big cable, but it is actually a rather tiny cable. And yeah, it has something at its hand. The something is actually a GSM phone. It gets power from the USB connection. This is potentially a phone with an infinite battery, as long as it's plugged into something that has USB power indefinitely. The device itself is marketed as a location tracker and a, a usable in cars, where a thief would not be able to identify the USB cable as a location tracking device. And now this is absolute nonsense. The device has poor tracking precision. You would never find the car and makes no mention of tracking in its packaging. So is it a device to protect your car? No, it is a high speed data and charging cable. It says so right there. I also want to highlight how the packaging is designed to be opened and closed without trace, not something that's common for blister 
uh, blister uh, shipping hardware. This is because you need to add a SIM card to the cable to make it active and able to get on the phone network. In this manner, the cable can be delivered to the target still in its packaging. And it get worse. Uh, gets worse. Didn't I say it would? <laughs> it does. You can buy this monstrosity for $9.85 on eBay with free shipping. Or you could. I have to say that uh, they have cleaned up their act recently. But uh, when I prepared the presentation, eBay, Alibaba, and Amazon were all carrying this cable. So are we worried yet? OK, let's all take a deep breath. What in the heck is going on here? This is not only evil, it is also cheap. You would think that if you use this to spy on someone, at least in the United States, uh, you should go to jail for unauthorized wiretapping. But the device is effectively just a phone in a ridiculous form factor, so it's probably legal for Amazon and Alibaba to sell it. Corey Doctorow calls it trickle-down surveillance because it is apparently a low-quality, low-cost copy of a device the NSA had in their leak, leaked um, tailored operations catalog called named Cottonmouth. Now, the cable itself looks like this. A ribbon USB cable with a USB-A connector on one end and a micro USB on the other. Some folks have pictured it next to an Amazon Basics charging cable, and the size of the connector is frankly not that strange. For doing this in person, I would uh, hand you the cable uh, so that you can inspect it and see that it doesn't, doesn't really um, scream that anything is amiss. Um, but unfortunately, uh, we're still in the lockdown mode, so some other time. In the meantime, trust me, it does not stand out. Until it is fielded for use and the casing is super glued as one does, the cover slides off to reveal a small board. This is a GSM listening and location device hidden inside the plug of a standard USB data charging cable. It supports the 850, 900, 1800, and 1900 megahertz GSM frequencies. Uh, the cover of the USB A side slides off, so you can add a micro SIM card in the slot. The end cap of the USB A plug locks in place so that folks do not find out accidentally there is a phone in the cable you've just given them. It can do a bunch of things. It can track the location of the cable. It does not have GPS, so it won't give you a too precise a location. We're looking at tower triangulation with a service like Skyhook Wireless or the mobile carrier's own advertising data facility. Let's say that we're looking at roughly a mile plus or minus precision with a more densely populated area uh, likely delivering better resolution as the, the tower density increases. It has a microphone. It can listen to what you're saying. It has a collection of AT commands so that you can configure it. It can send text messages, tell you where it is. <sighs> and you can text to the cable to change its mode of operation. And it, can even, and it even has a decibel trigger mode. It can call you when it hears a sound over 40 decibels so you can listen in to what's going on. And the chip is a MediaTek CPU that does not have a published spec sheet. It is believed to be a chip designed for low-cost smartwatches. And there is a serial port that shows the initial bootloader sequence. But once it goes past the bootloader, it is uh, no longer configured for uh, the kernel to go to, uh, to serial. So the kernel does not post messages there. This device has undocumented commands that nobody knows what they do and sends packets to places in China that we do not exactly understand but presume are used for the geolocation service. Never, ever plug this device or any other kind of crap like this into a computer and that you trust unless it is a secured lab facility. And as I said before, you consider that computer um, um, a sacrificial an object that's not going to be used for anything else. 
Here is the view inside the case. As best as we can tell, the USB lines bypass the device itself and go back to the cable. Save, of course, for stealing a little bit of juice off the wire. The mini SIM card reader is in the center. This device is quite finicky about the SIM cards it will accept. On the right, you can see the electric microphone commonly found in any standard USB charging cable. Not. On the flip side, we find the pads to the serial port conveniently labeled. So bonus points for that. Uh, the MediaTek CPU is in center stage. And um, similar logic, we are uh, going to skip the demo here. But a couple of considerations. Um, uh, there is one thing, uh, this device, this particular device is actually relatively safe to speak about because um, it's increasingly harder to make it work in the United States because G2 networks in the United States have been shut down, right? Uh, AT&T shut down its G2 network. Uh, GSM service is no longer available as a result. Um, for demos, I thought I could get around using a T-Mobile that should still be running um, uh, a GSM network, uh, but I could not get the device to join the network. Um, it's really hard to debug a headless device, so um, it's no fun. Um, so I first thought that maybe the limited antenna and low transmission power could be the issue, but then I went outdoors, that didn't seem to change anything. Um, there did seem to be T-Mobile coverage. There are other networks, maybe for IoT data transmission, that still cover GSM protocol. But um, it's increasingly unlikely that you'll be able to make uh, a G2 network work in the United States and in, um, in several parts of Europe, um, as the, the space, the hardware, and ultimately the spectrum is being reclaimed. But in China, there are. Um, there are uh, newer, uh, newer wireless protocol versions of this cable. It does look like uh, eBay and Amazon are not selling those. They uh, improve their filtering, and they're not um, they're not carrying that. Alibaba, as usual, carries anything that's manufactured in its own country. So probably you can find um, um, at least uh, G three networks. Uh, compatible versions there, which would work on any anything uh, currently in existence. I haven't tried, but um, uh, that is uh, that is likely possible. Uh, this also came to fame a few months ago. Uh, MG, the hacker that I was mentioning before for the OMG cable, was looking at pictures of um, a wiretapped phone that uh, had been suspected of having been wiretapped by Russian security services. And um, basically, the, the battery had been replaced with a smaller battery to make room inside the phone. And inside the phone was a board that looks suspiciously like this. So it seemed like a little bit odd that the nation state would use this kind of low cost technology to, um, uh, to jury rig a wiretap. But, um, uh, but apparently it's happening, or or somebody did it. Um, we don't really know who does these things because they don't come out and announce it. Um, but um, there are uh, examples of this happening in the wild, uh, even in high-profile uh, political cases, apparently. Um, so, um, OK. So what does this operation look like? Um, if we were running the cable, here is what you would have seen. The cable is in use, meaning it's powered. It should not matter if a battery or a wall power source is in use. Now we can do multiple things. The coolest of these is making a phone call to the cable. <laughs> the hacker over there knows the phone number of the cable, and she dials it. On this side, the cable picks up the call, starts sending back what the microphone can hear until she hangs up. Not bad for a start. Um, but uh, we are trendy, and we can do something more. We text the implant next. 
After the hacker sends the three-letter command LOC in a text message to that same number, she will get the text message back geolocating the phone to a city in the world, Westford, Massachusetts, and including a link to a page on a site called gpsui.net showing a map of the appropriate position with roughly one mile accuracy. Another interesting text message is 1111, four ones. Uh, this activates a mode in which the implant will call the attacker back, back if the noise at the location exceeds 40, 40 decibels. Perhaps a conversation is underway and they can even stop. A security analyst named Mitch dissected the implant uh, a few years ago. I think it was uh, four years ago, maybe five. It's been a while. And uh, you can find more details in his write-up. He went really deep into the hardware. So in closing about this, um, obviously doing this is in violation of US laws requiring two parties to be aware a call is going on or both parties having to consent to a conversation being recorded and probably a bunch of other things. Please don't do anything like this. It is a crime in most US states. Clearly we have rules about this not being acceptable, but what is changing is that folks willing to break the law can do so with a very low barrier to entry, namely $25 on Amazon or eBay. Before, you had to go to some black market purveyor of illicit goods, who knows where in the back of Tony Soprano's restaurant or something. And you had to find out who they were in the first place, uh, which hopefully would have had a high probability of getting you on the radar of law enforcement. Um, now you can just go on Alibaba and have them express delivered to you for free. I'm not impressed. This is not what the future should look like. Um, um, I know that I'm not going to say that we don't have bigger problems, but um, so let's go back to the security aspect. We were joking about the fact that it was easy to break in, but realistically, this is physical access. If you have a device, then you can do things to, to it. That's the first rule of computer security. In some of the devices that I've shown you, uh, we can also attack the device over Wi-Fi. Fine. And that hardly matters. What matters is that this brings the lost USB key attack to a new level. In a military base, people are trained to shoot on site when they see a USB key. But in a company setting, people are much more lax. They find the USB thing, let's look, in, look at it and see who do we need to return this to. Who lost it? I am amazed this sort of thing exists and is being produced on any sort of scale. I paid almost nothing for this device. Um, so this is something new to be on the lookout um, and on the lookout for if you work in any sort of operational capacity in a security sensitive industry. Now let's um, put it this in economic terms or in, um, in MBA terms, let's dump it down a little. Things change when you drop the cost of doing something by a factor of 10. Think of the Raspberry Pi. We went from $300, $300 computers to $30 computers and the Pi Zero showed the right kind of thinking, at least in the MBA sense of that, and it did another almost 10x drop going to $5, I think. Uh, this cable is dropping the cost of data exfiltration or surveillance or covert activity or industrial espionage to the point where everybody can afford it. I'm not going to say we do not have bigger problems, but this is not nice. Cheaper industrial espionage is not in the positive column of progress's ledger. This is why any place that then is any kind of real security should be pouring glue in their USB ports. There is no other reasonable solution. You can put locks on the USB ports. You can buy those and they look very cute. Uh, attackers will find a way to break them or your employees will break them for the attacker out of convenience. Yeah, we really need the USB port and, and this guy in IT doesn't want to let me use it. The only real solution to make USB safe is not to use it. Bearing that, you need to work to limit the blast radius of a breach. Realistically, the only reason why USB security is not a bigger issue today 
is that we're so bad at network security that it's easier and cheaper to explode here remotely. That's why people are not bothering to attack you with a USB device. It's like trying to distribute uh, viruses over floppies. Why would we need that? We can just embed them in um, some website. And when you visit the website, break the browser and go from there. Much cheaper, more effective, faster. Same kind of logic here. So uh, USB security is completely broken, but the hackers are better avenues right now. That's the only thing that is preventing this from being exploited in mass. But when somebody is tailoring an attack for you, uh, this is absolutely a viable strategy. It is an obvious strategy, actually, which is not a comforting thought because they are not tailoring an attack for you personally. They're more likely tailoring an attack to exfiltrate data from your employer. So maybe there is really no hope. Um, so even the people in charge of protecting White House data can seem to get this message. Um, but I choose to remain an optimist. So um, final reminder, use a sync stop. Put one in your travel bag. Put one in your computer bag. Uh, sync stop or any trusted brand of these. Do not buy an anonymously supplied no name sync stop because who knows what's in it. Um, this is a reconstruction of a tweet that was posted at scale 16 in Pasadena a few years ago. Someone ran to their session and forgot uh, their iPhone charger on the main hall, uh, you know, where the hallway track where everybody is saying hi, the, the, um, um, the social track of the conference so to, or the hallway track as we call it. The conference Twitter lit up with folks thinking this was a honeypot attack. So perhaps there is hope after all, at least some people get it. On that thought, and that is what I have. Um, this, is the, uh, this ends the 101. I hope um, some of you uh, better than me at embedded development have additional ideas or can suggest new tricks or or additional devices that you've seen in, in the Q&A. Uh, as usual, this is my contact info. And uh, that's that. OK, thank you, Federico. I found that very, very interesting. I, I had a bunch of those. Um, I didn't have the StopSync brand, but I had uh, similar ones. Uh, and they really worked great. I don't know where where they went since I've moved a couple of times since I bought them. <laughs> <laughs> so let me see. Um, okay, if I'm back on full screen, I can try to show you. Um, well, there isn't a whole lot to show, but I got this yesterday, which is a tutorial on how to using USB guard. Um, uh, on Linux, there is uh, a tool called USB Guard so that you can configure USB stack to uh, only allow USB connections from devices that are known device ID or known device type. So you can effectively do on a Linux host the kind of security that I was advocating that you would want some kind of... Uh, uh, sync stop with with a USB stack would be able to provide you with. Again, that doesn't stop a tailored attack against you, but um, but it stops a generic attack because you can basically say, I know the device IDs of the devices that are usually on my network. I am going to block everything else. And um, as an administrator, you can enforce that policy on your users. And um, other USB devices simply will not get a, a, a USB stack connection to complete. So it doesn't matter what the, the device is masquerading at. It, masquerading as, it just can't connect to the host. So uh, Linux has a solution for this. Um, I'm not sure if there is a similar uh, Windows solution that has emerged since I last looked. Um, 
I'm not aware of one, but if there is one, and that would be interesting to know. Uh, again, these are not things that are interesting to stop a tailored attack, which is typically what's going to happen with a USB device. Uh, they're coming after you or your employer specifically. So, uh, um, generically blocking things probably, is, uh, but it's a start. It's better than nothing. So Federico, uh, how did you do that uh, picture in picture thing uh, during your slides? Uh, if uh, when you're in screen share, um, right. So first I started uh, sharing my screen and then I went back to the Jitsi window and I clicked on the uh, camera icon and, and manually started the, the camera again. So starting the screen share automatically turned off the camera then I forced it back on by by clicking on the camera again. That's the Jitsi settings? Yeah, that's a it, fairly new feature bottom. of Jitsi. I think we used it last time or on one of my other meetings. Okay, when I click on the uh, on the little uh, pop-up thing for the camera on the bottom bar, it just shows me the uh, two different cameras, the webcam I have on USB and the built-in uh, camera in the laptop, which is inaccessible since the lid's closed. I don't see any picture-in-picture -picture thing on it. Yeah, there is no explicit setting. Basically, all that I did was click on the camera to restart it. Uh, so you're doing screen share, and then you just click on the camera icon in the little bottom bar? Exactly. OK, I'll have to do that, right? Yeah. I'm glad to hear it's a Jitsi feature, not a feature of Windows 10. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, this, uh, this machine is actually a, an old Mac, so. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Federico, I have a question. Uh, so imagine you have one of these um, uh, cellular cables that are you know, maliciously transmitting your thing. Can you, um, it would be interesting to think of um, a device that detects cellular signals and, and tells you when something is happening that you don't expect it. Have you ever looked into something like that? Yeah, I did, um, but I eventually looked like, like I was going to expand the scope of the talk indefinitely because I, there is a lot of devices here already, but I did do that. Um, so um, uh, the US is actually a relatively honest place, um, despite what, um, what Facebook is turning the country into. <laughs> um, but uh, just in terms of industrial security, if you look at places like China or Russia, um, companies spying on other companies is an extremely common thing. And it appears that in Russia, basically the way they protect themselves from this is that they hire retired uh, security services um, uh, personnel and they become head of security in, in a large company, kind of what we do here with ex-military, right? Um, the, the difference is that they don't use them only for defensive operations, they and also use them for offensive operations against their competitors. So there is a pretty um, uh, evolved landscape of um, industrial espionage going on both there and in China where companies are um, spying on each other using voice data, anything you can possibly imagine and even even things that are classified uh, like uh, tempest type attacks so electromagnetic um, signal leak so uh, as you can imagine there are there is also an industry to defend from these so if you go to Alibaba you can find all sort of devices that are meant to uh, discover uh, bugs so um, 
bugging someone's phone or um, now I guess uh, having a bug that is also a cell phone are pretty old attacks. And so uh, there are devices to do a security sweep of a room and find, uh, uh, find electromagnetic signals. Um, where do they come from? Uh, what's going on here? Of course, the device can be laying dormant, so that, um, that makes things more interesting. Um, uh, these devices also have other things. They have um, um, pretty simple, but, um, but perhaps uh, better than nothing, uh, optical ways to look for camera lenses, because wire tapping often will involve cameras. So um, they're looking for the glint of reflection that a lens uh, always has. And um, I even tested them, but there are all sort of these devices to look for wiretapping listed up on, on Alibaba or uh, maybe some of them are on eBay, but I, I saw the, the main collection on Alibaba. And, and there are a lot of uh, societies, China being a very notable one where everything is on camera, everything is recorded uh, by the state and that is, uh, that is legal, <laughs> but there is a lot of recording going on that is not legal uh, by by rogue actors, and so uh, the security team of a company has to to basically do what we would do when we're protecting a government official, and we have them in a skiff for for um, certain types of meetings or certain phone calls, and they have to deal with this for maybe just. <laughs> an industrial chemical company. It's, um, it's crazy, but it's it's the way it is. So there, there are a lot of these devices. I think um, the obvious targets are EM uh, emissions. Um, the idea about um, spotting camera lenses is also interesting. I think that on the EM front, obviously the device will, um, will lay dormant if it at all can. So, um, uh, the simpler devices that have a live connection to the phone network, you can catch because they, they're always uh, pinging back and forth. Um, another device that may be more opportunistic and establish a connection only when it has something to send, and may be more complicated. I think, um, yeah, it gets incrementally more complex depending on what the attack is, but um, it is possible. And there are, are relatively, cheap spectrum analyzers that you can use for software defined radio, which would be a completely different talk, not security related, but just figuring out how you can do software defined radio. There are wonderful tools there, but you can, you can listen to the spectrum of what's going on in your, in your immediate vicinity and try to detect that. Uh, I think that it's difficult to distinguish the mobile phones in the pockets of the people in your, um, in your entourage or in your, in your visitor's entourage from uh, rogue devices. Maybe you have to let them leave uh, mobile phones at the entrance if you want to establish a secure perimeter of that kind. Uh, but you can do something. Um, it's not a one size fits all. So uh, you will need to have multiple, multiple defense strategies. Uh, going back to the OMG cable by, uh, by MG, I think that he has a device that's also meant to test cables to see if um, if they are active. So uh, that will not also will not catch 100% of rogues, but um, but it will basically um, let you discover if a cable becomes active with no reason. Right, right. The cables are supposed to be inert. <laughs> They're not supposed to initiate a, a connection on their own or to transmit data on their own. So you can plug these suspect devices into, into um, MG's uh, detector and see if they do anything. Um, if they do, then there are two possibilities. Either it's a rogue cable or it's a cable that has um, uh, some more advanced functionality. Uh, there are a lot of USB uh, well, they are not cables at the point. They are dongles, right? And so they have they have some chip in the dongle that is performing some function, and you are correctly detecting them. Except that they are not all rogue. Some of them may be uh, maybe doing something beneficial, like <laughs> translating um, translating one version of USB into um, into I don't know um, 
mini display port or who knows. So as usual, it's complicated, but there are a bunch of things that you can do and the, the, the super set of these maybe can form a strategy. Well, that was a fascinating and, comp and comprehensive answer though, just want to say. <laughs> <laughs> it, it would be easier if there was a simple answer, but um, yeah. <laughs> the complicated answer is, is interesting. So Kurt, are you here to heckle me? Sounds like Kurt is not prepared to speak. I think he uh, fell asleep. <laughs> He's getting old. Aren't we old? Aren't we all? Well, these cables are fascinating, but you work for a uh, prominent North American uh, Linux vendor. Uh, right. Have you ever heard of these, um, you know, attacks in the wild is in, as far as, you know, you've been aware of? So I work on, on storage. So my level of uh, security paranoia is of a different kind. And it's usually on the, on the TCP network. And uh, there is paranoia going on because my storage product is, is a distributed product with many machines, but, uh, but I don't have to deal with these. Um, I've not seen this going on, but I'm not, uh, I'm not on the RHEL security team. They see things that are wild. And um, when I'm called in to, uh, to consult on, uh, on uh, architectures that involve multiple products, for, uh, for the federal government, the things that we're defending against are just sheer lunacy, all right? We're like, is this requirement for real or is did they just dream it up? Like we, sometimes we cannot even imagine what the attack vector that we're trying to defend against is. And when you're working with the government, they can only tell you so much, right? So they just go, you have to stop this. It's like, but why, why, why would you do that? And so without knowing what the attack is, it, it gets very um, interesting, but in a confusing way. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on one of those right now, and, and the stuff that we're coming up with is, is just nuts. But it's not, it's not a hardware issue. They, they audit their own hardware, so they're telling us the hardware is safe. We just have to worry about that. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it keeps things interesting. And I think that the fact that we don't get the details is, is also effectively a measure for our own protection because, you know, nobody can go and uh, perform what uh, Bill Ricker calls uh, rubber hose script analysis. They, they cannot go and beat the details out of us because we don't have them. So it, it may be difficult to work this way, but, and, but it's also safer. Yeah, Ricker didn't show people. up tonight. We still need to find speakers for November and December. Um, you need help uh, recruiting somebody? Yeah, right, right now I don't don't really have any ideas for uh, what, what to do talk about. Um, Jonathan, uh, I should send an email to Jonathan, um, the space guy. Oh. And see what he has. He's got an interesting, a bunch of interesting talks. He was very busy okay. last summer. And he said, uh, let him know in the fall. There should be a pretty interesting thing that, um, that uh, he can explain. <laughs> so yeah, if you have been reading the news there in the last uh, few days, there was this report that uh, the China may have tested the hypersonic weapon. That's, yeah. that's all that the news says, but um, that that makes it sound absolutely awesome and terrifying, and and that's all that makes the news. But the hypersonic 
weapon basically means that you're launching something at orbital speeds. Um, and so uh, the titles were very sensational. Uh, the, the newspaper I've, I've seen this on was a British paper that's uh, somewhat on the alarmist side of the scale. And so they're like, this has never been done before. And I was like, oh, come on. This has been done in 1965 the first time by, by uh, the Russian military. And uh, what is the newspaper? The way you do so this is basically that you launch the newspaper is the Telegraph, um, but uh, there were reports elsewhere of this um, uh, hypersonic weapon test. But hypersonic weapon means that you put something in orbit and you deorbited it, which is something that a lot of nations have done plenty of. Uh, the question that um, how you do it as a weapon is that you need to deorbit with precision. That's the problem that the Soviets could not solve in the in the 70s. Also, the Soviets had 10,000 weapons, so they're like, we don't need to figure out this problem. We can just launch 10,000. Um, but in terms of creating strategic asymmetry, the, the, uh, and in terms of creating something that's not nuclear, hypersonic weapon is interesting. So what is it? You launch this thing on an orbital trajectory. You literally put it in orbit, but probably at low altitude, maybe 150 kilometers, something where an orbit would not be sustained for more than a few days but you don't care because you're not planning to complete even your first orbit. You do three quarters of an orbit or however far you need to go before you reach your target and then you deorbit over your target. Okay. So this is, this is called a fractional orbit uh, bombardment system, FOBS. And it was uh, created by Russians in 65 and made operational in 71. Now, the reason why I'm bringing up Jonathan here is that when you put something up in orbit, Space Watch issues numbers for it. So the, the Chinese test, whatever the test was, uh, Space Watch, the, the US uh, Space Command, issued two numbers for these things. I suppose one was the warhead and the other one was the launcher. And they were like, orbital elements pending. We'll see them later. When, when we see a few orbits, we'll tell you what the orbital elements are. There was no orbit. There was the launch, and then they disappeared. So it's very unusual to see Space Watch numbers not go forward. There were, there were these two numbers that are like reserved, reserved, and then whatever next launches happen. And then the numbers for these launches slid back by two because the other two objects disappeared. <laughs> so it, it was very unusual, and it kind of called a lot of attention if you watch a space catalog launches because it's like, what happened? Why did these things suddenly change number? They ne that never happens. So it's interesting. If you bring Jonathan, I want his, his, uh, his story on this. Yeah, I'll try to bring Jonathan in the next couple of months. Uh, Shankar is asking a question. Uh, have you, can you see the chat oh, panel? I have it somewhere. Participants, open, yes. Okay, so Shankar, the is not cooperating, but I wanted to ask if there have been any further reports of such eavesdropping devices being snuck in via supply chain attacks. Um, to be honest, I haven't been looking, but I didn't see anything. Uh, there were reports of supply chain attacks against uh, super micro servers. Um, I think it was two years ago. Um, it's still an unresolved question and I don't know um, I don't know what it means. Um, certainly there are supply ch supply chain attacks against hardware that there is no doubt about that. but um, they're usually highly targeted. the the super micro one is the only one that went into the public sphere because Bloomberg reported it. Now, um, I'm usually very critical of news media. I think that they have a lower standard for what they do than just about anybody except maybe the... I, actually, that's not fair. The people that pick up the garbage have higher standards. Um, so news media is basically... I have 350,000 planes that took up took to the air today and I'm not going to report that it's good and everything is fine. And yay, we have chairs in the sky for a million people. I'm going to report that one plane 
crashed and that is what I'm going to hammer on for a week. Now, I understand that the media has a watchdog function and the fact that they report on the one crashing plane makes the world better. But the fact that they are obsessive about finding things going wrong and not reporting on the things going right is skewing the world into an excessively pessimistic view. And uh, now that the media is not about getting TV subscriptions or things that people have to be relatively comfortable with, if you have somebody obnoxious on the TV all day, uh, most people will tune them off. Uh, it's just, can I click bait you into clicking? It's really absolutely ridiculous. Now, with that baseline, I am very, very <laughs> picky about the news that I read. And I do read Bloomberg because I think that their reporting is among the best among uh, US news. However, I don't know uh, how good or bad the reporting on this thing was because uh, the reporter that came up with this, um, I think, wrote two articles about it. He has not retracted the story. The, um, Bloomberg has not retracted the story, but everybody involved, government, super micro, everybody else has said, no, uh, this, this didn't happen. So um, I'm pretty sure that there are supply, supply chain attacks going on because that's an obvious thing. We know that the NSA has been doing that kind of thing to other countries um, because of leaks that's been shown. So we know that that is going on at high levels in terms of non, uh, non bloody warfare between global powers. But um, in terms of things being in the server that you mail order and come into your data center, I think that's somewhat um, doubtful, especially because when you get found out, that problem has to get fixed. So putting something in all super microservers looks like a really stupid thing to do because you're, you're compromising your ability to play this game. So um, one equally possible theory about super micro is that somebody wanted to depress the super micro uh, stock price and they did. Their, their stock price was less than half than what it used to be for more than a year. And then eventually it went back to where it was afterwards. So I don't know what's the truth about the super micro thing specifically. It's it's an interesting one because it's it's murky and it involves people that usually do a, do a good job about reporting, but reporting things that don't seem convincing or don't make sense. So maybe the sources weren't good enough. Who knows? There are supply chain attacks going on, but they haven't been reported after this one, perhaps because this one was likely a dud of a story. So maybe people are a little bit uh, careful now? Who knows? It seems to me that any, basically any sort of scare, scare uh, mongering kind of story gets uh, gets to the news because there is no cost. You can retract it the day after in the worst case, worst case scenario if you are worried about a lawsuit. Um, so I don't think that's a sufficient deterrent. But one way or another, um, they haven't they haven't popped up. So no, I haven't seen anything. Specifically about microphones, I have absolutely seen nothing. The the ones that I, the ones like the Super Micro one are are network taps. They're not audio taps, but there are um, there are, are a different family of audio related things that's been appearing, which is uh, talking to voice assistant remote uh, voice assist assistants remotely. You can, uh, so uh, Alexa, uh, uh, I forget what Apple's uh, Siri capable speaker is called, um, and then the Google Home, all of these devices tend to use MEMS type microphones. So there are some mm, semiconductor chips that, uh, well, they're not chip, maybe they are chips, but there are semiconductors that act as microphones. They're not. Uh, something like an electret microphone or a cardioid or anything that we would recognize as a microphone. They just look like a chip on a board. You can excite these uh, microphones with a laser. So uh, there is academic research and there are published papers. I think I've seen one out of Israel. Um, and I don't remember where the other ones come from where basically people can point a laser at, uh, at Google, Google Home from a couple hundred yards away and modulate voice into the voice assistant. 
And because typically we don't require password authentication for these devices, you can issue commands. In fact, I think one of the big selling points of, of a voice assistant is that it does not require authentication, right? If I tell my mobile phone, hey, Siri, when is my next meeting? My mobile phone answers, you have to unlock the iPhone for. But if I tell my speaker, uh, hey, Siri, when is my next meeting? It knows it's in my home. It considers itself secure if it was con configured that way. And it will just tell me, which is a heck of a lot more helpful than than not tell me telling me when is my next meeting. But because these devices are often passwordless, the fact that you can have a, a voice channel into them remotely is a new is a new avenue of attack. That's the most interesting thing that I've heard that was voice based. Uh, sure. Thank you, Shankar. Uh, and there is, Jan is saying that wireless keyboards and mice are very risky. And uh, actually, he is right. Um, I've actually seen some, uh, I think it was a Microsoft wireless keyboard. I'm, don't quote me on that, but I think it was Microsoft. Um, a few days ago in Best Buy that was um, labeled saying that there was a certain level of, uh, of crypto encoding between the dongle and the, um, and the keyboard. Uh, generally speaking, uh, that is an, an important reassurance when they're using a proprietary protocol between the, between the dongle and the keyboard. It shouldn't be so much of a concern if you're using a standard Bluetooth because obviously the Bluetooth stack has to be secure for other reasons. Never mind the fact that it's been, it's been broken a million times, but um, it needs to be secured one way or another because you're carrying a Bluetooth device all the time around. So assuming that problem is solved, the Bluetooth keyboard would also be fine. But um, in many cases, there are these proprietary device protocols for, for mouse and keyboard because we want the mouse uh, and keyboard to run for a year on very little power. So um, you can't do that with Bluetooth, even Bluetooth LE, I don't think. So that's, that's the impetus for um, for a custom thing. Uh, I just want to say it's interesting that um, when you have a very low low power, low sophistication device, you can you can trust it a bit more because you're when you program it, you mm -hmm. assume the bootloader is very unsophisticated and you have full control of the device. But then once it gets more complicated, all of a sudden you can't trust it. Um, you right. know, and um, that's that's where, you know, if it, if it was free software like our, you know, GNU Linux distributions, maybe, but maybe you could trust it more. So someday we're going to see... Um, we're gonna be see, see uh, what Red Hat uh, Linux on these uh, <laughs> on these uh, cables. You're gonna be you're gonna be selling these things, right? Maybe. <laughs> Who knows? But the thing is this: yes, there is some. Um, so there are two things there. One is complexity, obviously. Obviously, uh, breeds more places where attacks can be uh, can be hidden, but. Um, but complexity usually arises because you're trying to make the, the world safer from the simpler attacks, right? So if you have a keyboard that's just transmitting analog signals to the, to the device, to use the example from before, you can basically eavesdrop on that with an oscilloscope. Um, so you go and add multiple layers on the stack because you're not going to code crypto directly on bare metal. And so that adds the complexity. You're protected from the previous attack, but now you have the additional complexity of all these layers. And then more difficult attacks come in. I think it's fine. Um, I mean, the world doesn't need to be 100% secure. It's interesting for us intellectually to discuss uh, what it takes to protect things. But unless you are responsible for a nuclear power plant or an ICBM, things don't need to be 100% <laughs> secure because uh, usually a failure is not that terrible. Um, you have to choose a threat profile that's suitable for the information being protected. Now, 
Granted, I think our industry and all industries depend on ours is not doing a good enough job. If you look at uh, T-Mobile, they have a data link every year regularly, like clockwork. Then they apologize. Oh, I'm sorry, we leaked all the data of all our customers. Next year, let's do it again. I, I don't understand exactly what's going on there. It, it's embarrassing enough when Yahoo did it once. Uh, T-Mobile does it every year. So then you go to officials, which is the place where it's really secure. I think most of the banks have their act together because they don't want to lose money. There, there is a serious impact there uh, in the in the pecuniary sense. But the rating agencies, they they take care of our data as as if it was uh, recycled paper. I mean, they just lose it with no regard, no rhyme or reason. Oh yes, we leaked all your data. Uh, we're going to give you a fifteen dollar coupon for uh, for uh, identity protection for a year. Um, Okay, <laughs> I think at, at some point, uh, the problem is that there is no standard threat profile defined by the law. One thing is for a company to say, I'm going to need to protect the data to this level because I'm not gonna leak who my customers are, for example. Uh, I'm not going to leak data of these types because regulation says that I cannot, uh, like banks cannot lose data about their accounts. They have to have them for the lifetime of the account plus, I don't know, 20 years. It's something unbelievably long. Um, and there are real consequences to losing that, so banks don't lose it. But in many uh, industries, this is undefined and not having a threat profile defined by a regulator, I mean, it doesn't need to be Congress, but at least an industry, uh, an industry group, uh, if you don't want regulation. Let's have the industry group of, um, Whoever is in charge of credit rating to the finest standard, you have to protect um, the identity of citizens, um, well, of anybody that you're credit rating up to this level. And everybody has to meet it. And there are a lot of standards that don't come from the government and they're equally useful, like, I don't know, MPAA movie ratings. The fact that we don't have those means that all that the, these vendors do is say, oh, we leak data, we apologize, we are preparing for the class action suit where the the uh, the attorney that that crossed the line first and got and got appointed the defender of the class is going to get two hundred million dollars, and all of you are going to get five dollars plus a coupon for uh, for defense of your data for a year. Um, that doesn't work on multiple levels. So um, there have to be standards. Uh, there have to be consequences for the company, and uh, they don't need to involve uh, yachts or parasite lawyers. They have to involve some tangible consequence for the company that makes it so the company doesn't do it. And the company needs to know what the target that they are aiming for is, because they cannot aim for a fuzzy cloud where they get criticized for leaking, well, and parking information. Federico is a reserved parking spot in Westford. Is that a problem? Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. Define a threat profile, decide that it is protected information or not. So to be fair to the companies, there has to be that kind of target. Now, the other thing here is um, uh, in terms of the analog versus, uh, versus non-analog, -analog, uh, there is a lot of, um, there is a lot of data leakage out of simple devices, unfortunately. <laughs> so, um, while complexity is a problem because it breeds places to hide things in, and then it breeds the problem of securing the supply chain, uh, simplicity usually is no defense either. And then um, I appreciate the, the enthusiasm for open source, but open source is a different problem. So if you have a proprietary supplier, we don't know what's in their code. So until somebody breaches them, uh, we don't know what's in the proprietary stack um, that could have been dangerous. And uh, with the exception of very few people, like the US government and the Chinese government can look at Microsoft's code in, in sealed rooms where they cannot take any of the code out. They can go and read the code and, and decide, yes, OK, we trust this code. But for the rest of us, that's not possible. Um, you would think that open source would be fine, but the problem is that yes, for something that's high value, 
you can hire a, an open source vendor and say, here are the bits from Red Hat. They are trusted. We looked into them. Here are the bits from Ubuntu. They are trusted. We looked into them. And they're signed. And um, you know, we, you allegedly know what's in them. Um, but uh, if you look at most web applications, they're built with things that don't come out of the Linux vendor. They come out of GitHub repositories. Uh, or actually, it's not GitHub. It's it's Node, right? It's uh, uh, which is now a property of GitHub. So I suppose I'm right. But um, a lot of things are built with Node repositories that nobody has any idea where they come from, who owns them, or what. And when you start auditing the the chain of a web application, usually you have a chain of 200 dependencies, at least going to, from one library to the next library. This other library chains into another thing. Uh, for an embedded developer, it's kind of crazy. You go, you're using high-level languages and chaining like this. Uh, the amount of performance that you're wasting is unbelievable. But they're not, they're not there for performance. They're there for the market. So what do people want to code in? Electron, Node. OK. And those are not um, optimized applications, but they're easy to develop in. And uh, Node, in particular, brings in a crazy number of dependencies. but. I don't want to pick a node specifically. There are lots of JavaScript, or uh, you could do the same thing with Python, frankly. You can bring in lots of dependencies from, um, from pip. Nobody has ever looked at those. All that it says is, yeah, somebody put this library on pip, and Federico trusted uh, uh, Kurt's library, and Jerry trusted Federico's library, and up the stack, you have 10 layers. At some point, Federico retired. He is tired of maintaining this time zone library. And the guy that takes over maybe puts something in the time zone library. So um, unless you're willing to audit all of that, um, there is a problem even with open source. And with open source, the problem is that nobody is paying for that auditing to happen because it's very labor intensive. and. Uh, what you deliver on the other end must be very cheap. So I think that the economic problem is is on the open source side. The transparency problem is on the on the closed so, uh, closed software side. So on the proprietary software side. So yeah, it's a, it's an issue. <laughs> it is definitely an issue. But supply chain attacks now are in the forefront, not just in hardware, but especially in software. So this will have to be addressed somehow because. And it's not theoretical and uh, manpower intensive like the USB attacks. It's something that is happening. So um, so it will get attention. At the very least, when problems are exploited, it forces a response. I think that the fact that Windows 11 is requiring a TPM module and um, a secure bootloader is not no accident. It's basically cutting the line at you want to run Windows 11, you are going to run into an environment that we think we can secure at the hardware level. And that means Windows 11 doesn't run in 9 out of 10 devices that we have today, but maybe that's OK. I don't know that it solves all problems, but it solves some of the problems. Of course, it, it's wickedly complex to configure the new BIOS, um, I forget the name of it. Um, that's how much I like it. And um, and the TPM. So it's it's a UX problem. Um, if Microsoft can crack configuring those reliably across all vendors uh, so that we don't even know that there is a TPM, we're just asked to, to provide uh, uh, secure credentials for it, that's, that's a great step forward. Unfortunately, it's also locking us out of hardware. We, we wind up not being able to play with hardware. So it cuts another way. But maybe some hardware is secured one way and some hardware gets secured another way. You can become your own authority if you're willing to go through that level of pain. Or you buy some unsecured hardware at the Raspberry Pi level, maybe, um, and, and you do your experimenting there. Like Steve Jobs used to say, the fact that you're making one thing one particular way doesn't mean that people cannot buy another thing that's done another way. <laughs> Your one device doesn't have to solve everybody. Um, but if it is a popular device, it needs to be good for a lot of people.
Were you trying to think of UEFI? Ah, thank you. Yes. Actually, I have to say that the last time I set up a, a, an Ubuntu device um, on a U, UFI machine, it was, uh, uh, it was uh, relatively seamless. I had a traumatizing experience in the early days of UFI and uh, always gone. Other way, no, forget it. Um, but recently I had a device that was UFI only and, um, and I don't remember what version of Ubuntu I was setting up on it, but it, it just worked. So it looks like UFI is no longer a UX problem. TPM. Yeah, we've, been uh, using, we've been using UFI, UEFI for a long time. <clears throat> the big issue with Microsoft is the secure boot portion of that. Right. Because a lot of the uh, servers that uh, I used to run at Algorithmics, IBM, and uh, HP were all UEFI. So do those new requirements mean you're not, not going to be able to run Windows 11 in a VM? Uh, that's interesting. I uh, I don't know what's going to happen in a VM when you're, the VM is not running atop Windows. <laughs> that's a good question. I imagine that Windows atop Windows, you can probably find a way to to funnel the relevant inform the pertinent information but i don't know what would happen with windows on top of um i don't know esx or on top of kvm i believe some hypervisors virtualize tpm so it's a, a software tpm right well i guess that that partially defeats the purpose but you can still run windows so yeah true yeah that makes sense Oh, and I was talking Raspberry Pi is the ultimate TPM free device, but there are actually add on boards for Raspberry Pi with a TPM model if you want one. So um, that can also be a, a cheap uh, experimenting platform for TPM. Um, yeah. I'm not an expert in TPM, but I, I, um, I have a vague memory that the, um, Firmware in the CPUs can implement TPM, can you know have a virtual TPMs, and um, uh, so it's not like you. But when I learned about TPMs a long time ago, it was a separate chip. But nowadays, yeah. it's it's less that it's, that's not so often. Yeah, it's it's migrated in. We actually have, I don't know if it's recorded in our library, but uh, we have uh, we have James Bottomley, the, one of the Linux TPM authorities as a guest a few years ago. Uh, I can't remember if we recorded him or not, but he, he went really deep into how the, the system works on Linux. I thought that there were, oh, there was another comment from Michael. Um, uh, so glad many laptops are going to USB-C as the only source of power. Um, <laughs> I think it may be a little bit snarky here. So the, the thing, uh, <laughs> uh, actually that's, uh, that is the thing that I like the most about the Apple announcement. Um, was it Monday, Tuesday? Uh, because uh, Apple devices are going, app, Apple laptops are going back to MagSafe. So, um, First of all, I like MagSafe because I, as you can imagine, I'm in front of a computer all the time. I fall asleep in front of a computer, I drop a computer, and I trip on the cable, all sorts of things. So MagSafe absolutely makes sense for me, and I absolutely hate how snug the USB-C connection is because um, at the very least, I break the cable. If not, I, I damage the laptop. So uh, actually, I had an occurrence of that. Um, with a very important laptop, actually, I think it was my wife's uh, PhD thesis was on it, and the device fell, and the cable broke the motherboard power connector. Um, we had to uh, find a replacement power connector, do surgery on the motherboard to, uh, to resuscitate it. So uh, these are real problems, even with the strong chassis that we have right now breaking connector in on the motherboard is is far from uh, from impossible so magsafe is an absolutely awesome thing on that regard but also given what i've said 
having a charging channel that is power only, no data. Yay, <laughs> I'm all for it. Also, by the way, the new laptops from Apple, they can still charge over USB-C. So if you don't care, if you have a trusted USB-C charger, you can also charge over USB-C. But um, having a power only uh, channel for me is, is the ultimate thing. So I think that Apple has secured my business for, for, for the next few years there. <laughs> I'm also a notoriously an ARM fan, so I'm I'm quite interested in seeing what uh, all my uh, Macs are obviously x86 right now. Well, I, I suppose in the lab I have some older power hardware just for kicks, but um, um, I'm curious to to see what ARM on the desktop, uh, real ARM on the real desktop looks like. Yeah, that that might be interesting. Mm -hmm. Our friend John Masters has deserted Red Hat a few a few weeks ago. He is now at Google. So I think I may soon become the leading ARM advocate in Red Hat without him around. <laughs> oh, well. I don't know if I'm up. I don't know if I'm up to the task. We need to bring him back. <laughs> Do you think uh, Risk Five could uh, surpass ARM in your uh, efficacy? Um, I'm not a, a microprocessor uh, nerd like uh, like Jan is, so I don't really have an opinion on the on the microarchitecture like he would. I tend to um, like or dislike chips based on on how I feel when when writing assembler, and so uh, there are things that I like like Motorola Power PC. Um, 68K, generally that lineage that is uh, very um, assembly. Uh, the assembler for those chips is very reasonable. Also, um, old MIPS was probably the easiest assembler you could possibly write. I haven't looked at RISC-V. I hope that it's in the, in the same strain as the, as the traditional MIPS in terms of that aspect. Um, Alpha was okay. Um, X86 is probably the worst of the lot. Um, Spark was also a pretty ugly offender with its circular registry. It's like, who came up with that? Um, but um, the Motorola chip in general had lots of registers. They had a memory uh, register on chip. So that's effectively its memory. You had like one kilobyte of memory. So you didn't need to go through RAM, bring up before you could actually run, write a little bit of code. So they were very friendly to, to the software engineer, to the embedded engineer. And, um, and the MIPS devices are probably, they don't have that memory register as, as far as I remember, but, uh, but they had at least lots of registers and a very clean syntax. So um, I like it, but uh, whether I like it or not doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, ARM is very successful on mobile devices now Apple is going to make it a success on the desktop. Um, I suppose it's anybody's guess if Apple decides to go into the data center. That would be uh, that would be interesting. Apple hasn't made a server since they used to make the um, the X serve. I think it was maybe they had it them in two thousand two two thousand three. I don't think much later than that. So Apple has retreated from the server space a long time ago. And their server operations are notoriously not running, um, not running macOS. They are running uh, either Linux or BSD, as far as um, the outside world is is aware of. So um, I don't know if they care. Uh, Apple is a, is a company that is really brilliant at focusing, so they probably don't need to go into the data center space if they have other businesses uh, that look more interesting. Uh, like, I don't know, healthcare or cars or who knows what. But uh, these chips certainly look awesome. However, they look awesome because of the integration. So the performance of the new um, uh, Apple Silicon stuff is great. Um, but it is also partially great because of the integrated memory architecture. So you're moving data between the CPU and the video card without copying it. Instead of spending 
most of your 4 gigahertz CPU from Intel copying data like an idiot um, and then doing some work on the data. The, the data is all in one place. And unless you need a copy because you're going to do different things to the two copies, uh, the Apple architecture is basically letting the CPU, the GPU, uh, and the video card access the same memory. So leaving aside the fact that the chip is good, the just the saving in terms of no, moving data around is, is fantastic. Now that is great for the desktop. But if you move to the data center, the data center doesn't have video cards. So you already lost a big advantage in terms of that memory movement. Uh, I think it would be awesome in terms of um, of Kurt's space. Kurt, are you awake? Uh, you can build um, you can build a cluster out of new Mac laptops. Um, I don't think they have enough Kurt, uh, enough cores uh, for Kurt to be interested right now, but they will. I think that the the max is ten cores, eight of which are serious cores. So. Um, I guess we would have to look at the power envelope to see if Kurt is interesting interested. But um, uh, Kurt disconnected a while ago. But um, the um, the fact that you are not moving data between the GPU and the CPU makes it potentially very interesting for uh, for accelerated computation like ML. So. Does Apple care to compete there? They're happy to let NVIDIA do it. Who knows? Um, can't tell because from Apple's point of view is what is the biggest market that they can go after? The one where they can make the biggest difference and produce the biggest product. And uh, it's a logic that's worked very well for them. And they have the discipline to follow it. So I don't think that we're going to see Apple in the data center very soon. But um, but that would be one scenario for ARM to be successful in the data center. Without that, I think that uh, um, AMD uh, AMD has compromised the path for ARM to the data center because AMD's latest chips are just too good. Why would you go through the transition of porting all of your applications to ARM when uh, when the advantage of ARM is now shrunk so far? that you can have the lower cost with an AMD chip. You can have better performance or same performance with an AMD chip. I think it, it undercuts the logic of ARM in the data center. Does it undercut it fully? I don't know. Uh, but the, the same problem kind of applies to, um, to risk v If there are two, if there is only a Intel giving you x86 chips, then somebody else has to emerge. But if there is um, if there is AMD doing a good job at competing, then as much as I dislike the assembler, um, uh, x86 is a reasonable choice. We have all the code. Um, if you if you can pit AMD and Intel against each other for giving you chips for a reasonable price and continuing to force progress. I don't know that there is that much of a room for, for ARM in the data center and, and even more so risk uh, There is uh, one fix for risk -free, however, which is China. Um, but wait, wait, what about, let me advocate for your own company. What about uh, Power9? Come on. It, oh. it's, it's got a Linux bootloader. Come on, let's, let's. I actually, <laughs> that's funny. I actually love power chips because going back to my logic, they have one of the neatest uh, uh, assembler languages that you can get your hands on today. Uh, let, leave aside the mainframe that's on in the doghouse, but the the power chip program, there's power chips. They are absolutely awesome, but it's it's a small market, right? It's not it's not mainstream. Uh, it keeps going, um, so hopefully it can continue. Um, Let's go back to PPA. Power, power has been more successful, I think, in embedded hardware historically than in, in the data center. Also, IBM has made lots of money from power in the data center, of course. But uh, the other thing that you could use to leverage risk v into a into a favorable position is that China wants to break into into tier one uh, markets as um, 
as a power player, not as the manufacturer, but as the designer, which uh, maybe it's a problem for us, but I think it's a legitimate aspiration for them. I mean, <laughs> who are we to tell them that they can't? So um, I think that we're seeing basically what happened in the 1970s when Japanese cars came in at the low end of the market and you had a very cheap, uh, I think that there were Datsun, which really is Nissan, low end, low cost cars. And then they moved up the quality chain and today basically the highest quality cars that you can buy in the US that are not luxury cars are Japanese cars. Uh, it's kind of Clayton Christensen's logic about uh, rebar and um, the evolution of the steel market. <laughs> you disrupt the steel market by coming in and making rebar, which is the lowest possible quality of steel, perfect this new technology that's low cost, which in the 1980s was called mini mills, a lot smaller uh, steel mills than traditional United Steel big gigantic operations. Um, traditional steel vendors like United Steel uh, were perfectly okay to let the new entrants make rebar because rebar is poor quality product, it's very low margin, and so um, sure you can have it. I have higher margins and higher problem, bigger problems to solve. But once the technology was perfected, they moved up, and now basically you cannot find a steel manufacturer in the United States that it's not a mini mill. Uh, we have seen the same, same thing with ARM processors. Sure, you can have the, the mobile phones. Um, I have desktops. I can make 10 times the money you make, well, actually probably 20 times the money that you make selling one phone uh, with, with, um, with uh, desktops. Uh, but then ARM moves, then smartphones happen and smartphones become ARM devices, and then tablets happen and they become ARM devices. And now laptops are becoming ARM devices and you have Intel CEO going into NBC or wherever else he was the other day saying that he's gonna fight hard for the market. It's like, okay, it's a privilege, but you've already lost it, it's too late. Um, so, um, Somebody is commenting that rebar is expensive now. Yes, that's a different supply chain problem. So um, I think that the thing about risk v is because uh, there are strategic restrictions about technology, which in part are legitimate um, because it's becoming increasingly possible to build increasingly dangerous things, not as USB cables, but as drones or as guided munitions or all sorts of things of that kind using technology that we consider off-the-shelf technology for, uh, for IT. There are all sorts of restrictions on circulating IP and actual hardware. Um, and um, ironically, because a lot of this stuff is made in China or in Taiwan, which is part of China, China feels left out of the, of the IP global ecosystem in, to a large extent. And so, I don't rule out that China could decide, hey, let's go behind risk V. It's open. We can we can beef up this and it could be an unrestricted chip that we have access to all the IP for. Um, that could very reasonably happen. And in fact, Alibaba has open sourced, um, I think it was a dozen or so risk five chip designs just a couple of days ago. How far does this go? How, com how uh, good can it be? I don't know. I mean, the last time I looked at RISC-V uh, was when uh, the vendor put out this announcement that said, we are not vulnerable to Spectre, which was, um, which was the most ridiculous bit of marketing that I've seen outside of the stuff that Jeff Bezos' rocket company does. Yes, uh, why is RISC-V not vulnerable to Spectre? because it is not a pipelined processor. So yes, I can go back and run a 1992 processor and not be vulnerable to Spectre. But pointing that out and saying, I'm, I'm running 1992 technology here is not the way to make your product look good. Um, basically, effectively, everybody that had branch prediction and pipelining had this problem. <laughs> um, ARM and... Um, ARM and uh, x86 alike, so massively different architectures. RISC-V was immune because at that point it was a really crappy chip. Now it's it's significantly better, 
let's see how far it goes. I, I can't really predict. It's interesting. Uh, and I have a few devices. And now they're actually, first one I got was able to run Arduino decently. The latest one I got uh, can run Linux. So uh, obviously, it's it's making inroads. <laughs> how long does it take? How far does it go? I, I can't say. So I see John saying that I'm speaking again in January, which I am. And uh, oh, so it looks like Jonathan is not available for November or December. Yeah, I went back to read the so, uh, our last uh, email so, together, um, and he said to contact can... him next year. Hmm. When is the presentation in November? I may, I may. Uh, have a volunteer for you. Well, the third Wednesday. Let me ask them. Calendar. Third Wednesday? Yep. Let's see. That would be uh, uh, Cal the 17th. November. Third Wednesday. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm looking at October. My bad. 17th? Yeah, seventeen. Okay. Seventeen. Yeah. Okay. Let me let me look into that and um if I have a volunteer, I'll let you know tomorrow. Okay, it sounds good. Great. Okay. We're about to shut down. Yeah, unless anyone else has any questions. Okay. Oh, the Thank you and have a good evening. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Good discussion, you. everybody. Thank you, Federico. Thanks. This was enlightening and scary. <laughs> That's why we have things to do. Scary. If all the problems were already solved, we wouldn't need to do anything.